Hey there, Slashaholics. Uh, while we're going through the opening credits of the upload here, a very important thing. If uh, you haven't listened to the prologue of Texas Chainsaw Massacre yet, there is a prologue that came before this chapter. Be sure to go to the description below. There's a link uh, to the narration of the prologue. Give it a listen and then come back and listen to chapter one. Thank you and enjoy the narration. The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 1 A scream ripped up the heat of the sweltering midday sun. Up close, the full-throttled shriek could have been the bloodied cry of a terrified animal, or it could have been the two-stroke gasoline-powered well of a 47-inch chainsaw. It was all noise, jagged, piercing, deafening. Only by moving away from the source was it possible to tell that the roar was actually the turbocharged thunder of an automobile engine. It was August 18, 1973, and the customized van was steadily making its way along the deserted rural highway that cut for miles through the wide open plains of Travis County, Texas. The road was long and narrow, bordered either side by great swaths of subtropical grasses that flourished in spite of the punishing sun. Every now and then, the van would go by a tree of some kind, mesquite, cottonwood, and there were places where these bleached trunks grew in number and huddled into dense, tangled groves, having learned to adapt to the bone-dry texture of the sandy soil. Its arid quality made plain by the thick clouds of dust kicked up in the van's wake. On one level, the scenery was beautiful. Green grass, the leaves of the tall trees, a clear blue sky with hardly a cloud and at times you could see right over to the horizon. But in some people's eyes, the prairie could be intimidating. It was vast and untamed, even after years of agriculture. You only had to drive through this baking sprawl to realize that the road map with all its fancy words and symbols really told you nothing about the place. Break down out here and you'd be lucky to get picked up for hours, maybe even days. And there was something unsettling about the road itself. It was just too damn long. The unmarked strip of tarmac went on forever, making you feel like you were going nowhere. No matter how far you drove, the route just kept straight on ahead of you. You could join the highway at any point, and you wouldn't have a clue where the hell you were until you saw a sign. It was as if the neglected route was stagnant in time. You felt like you'd die before you reached the end of the road. And then there was the heat the unrelenting, sweltering heat. In some places along the way, the air had been dry. In others, it was human. But all day long, the heat had been a bitch. Constant late summer of 92 and climbing. Yes, sir, with each passing minute, the road through the ass end of Travis was getting hotter. The van was cruising, barely tapping the true potential of its finely tuned engine. Sure, it could rip the tarmac and at the push of a pedal, but the driver was in no hurry. Kemper was damned proud of his badass baby, and driving it was his third greatest pleasure. When the vehicle had come off the factory line, it had been a plain old production standard Chrysler Dodge A100 wagon. But to look at it now, the van had been raked, lifting the rear off the chassis to give the wagon the hunched, road-hungry tilt of a rod. The wheels had been revamped, their gleaming chrome rims wrapped in four massive tires that didn't so much grip the road as strangle the damn life out of it, and the exhaust ended in two machine gun side pipes encased in perforated heat shields that ran along the bottom of the van one each side. 
but all this candy coating would have meant jack shit if the truck hadn't also got a turbocharger slamming air into the engine like some kind of haul-ass Hiroshima. An old joke went something like, You know you're a redneck if you think John Deere green, Ford blue, and Primer gray are the three primary colors. Well, Kemper was Texan-born and bred and the Dodge was spray-painted from roof to wheel, arch, and primer gray. So what? Make no mistake, Kemper loved his girl, and there was no goddamn way he would ever let anyone else get behind her wheel. Ever. And he didn't give a shit about redneck jokes, either. Ask any Texan who a redneck is, and chances are he'll say it's the next guy. But neither Kemper nor any of his four traveling companions genuinely met the criteria. They didn't even carry firearms, and there wasn't a redneck alive who would travel in Kemper's van as long as it had those decals on the fender, one showing a peace sign, the other the national flag of Mexico. Mexico, for Christ's sake. Did 1836 mean nothing to these coon shit kids? Music filtered out through the open windows of the van. It was southern rock, the guitar chords blending with the understated thrumming of the powerful, customized engine. And someone... A young woman sitting in the front passenger seat beside Kemper was singing along with the track. She was Texan, and her accent was a perfect match for the singer of the band. But she stank. Her singing was shit. Not that she cared. The music was loud, and she was having the greatest time, dusting this awesome countryside at a steady 50. Damn it. Filling her cells had never been this good. They were going to the show. Erin held the emery board in her right hand and was using it to smooth the nails on her left. But she'd barely finished when Kemper took hold of her left hand and kissed it. That was sweet, but it didn't stop her singing. She had her foot up on the dashboard, her scuffed brown platform shoe resting just inside the windscreen. There was a test of their relationship, and this was it. Kemper could see her foot all right, and Erin knew it was pissing him off. But who was it going to be, the van or her? Lucky for Aaron, sex was Kemper's numero uno greatest pleasure, and hadn't he just kissed her hand? If you don't know what I mean, bawled Aaron, pausing to pull her long, light brown hair back behind her ears as it spilled out from beneath the grimy white Stetson she knew she looked good in. She also wore beat-up flared jeans that were held in place by the kind of thick leather belt even her daddy would have respected. Nothing about Erin was showy. She was young, turned 20 last month, and naturally attractive. So she didn't need to put on the fake chrome and bullshit that Kemper welded to his van. The only reason Erin was showing her midriff and shoulders right now was because it was so damned hot. She lifted up the bottom of her white cotton tank top and tied it into a tight knot between her breasts. The two other guys in the van knew not to mess with her. Not because she was Kemper's girl, but because if there was an award for Miss Texas Tomboy, Aaron would win it, and she would kick their sorry little asses. A voice came from back inside the van. Would somebody please make her stop? Morgan sat rolling a joint. He was sprawled on a beanbag facing the side door, which made the journey kind of interesting each time Kemper hit a bump in the road or hung a bend too fast. And now Morgan had to suffer Aaron ruining a perfectly good tune. He didn't know where to put his face. He could stare out across the middle of the van and gaze out through the side door windows at a big expanse of nothing. He could turn left and get an earful of Aaron killing Leonard Skinner up front. Or he could look right and suffer the frustrating sight of Andy and Pepper making out on the long back seat, which was just in front of the luggage space next to the rear door. Some deal. Kemper and Aaron up front, Andy and Pepper down back, which left Morgan flying solo. It was a total downer. Why Pepper chose to waste her time on Action Andy was way beyond Morgan. It wasn't as if the two lovebirds even knew each other. So right now in the land of Morgan, confusion was king and Aaron's lousy, stinking noise had just been crowned queen, hence the weed. Not that Morgan needed an excuse. After all, the reason they'd just come up from Mexico was because Kemp... Won't you stand up and scream? Aaron blasted, not giving a damn about Morgan's whiny complaint. Kemper smiled. He was the same age as Aaron, both of them 2-0. Only he had spent his last decade in a state of car-crazy dementia. 
As long as he could remember, automobiles had been practically his whole life. When he was a kid, he spent all his money on car magazines and books, and he had a fine collection of toys and model four-wheelers of all kinds. Then, as soon as he was legal, he passed his test and bought his first car, a good-for-nothing Volkswagen. But he had started messing with engines long before that. In fact, he'd lined up his first job as a mechanic long before leaving high school. Kemper was a natural, and now he spent most of his waking hours fixing, tuning, restoring, and customizing automobiles, which went some way to explain why his clothes were always covered in oil stains, and why the black lines in his hands were so persistent. Take now, for instance. He was wearing a mixture of clothing from home and stuff from work. His dark denim shirt came straight from shop, which is why his sleeves were torn off at the elbow, to give him freedom to work and there was a white and blue patch sewn in place just above his left breast pocket with the word Kemper, embroidered in fancy letters. This suited Kemper just fine. He was proud of what he was, which is why you never saw him without his baseball cap with its big monogrammed K dead in center of his forehead. The black t-shirt and baggy utility pants he wore only completed the image of a totally dedicated gearhead. God, if only he could do something about the heat. They had all the windows open, even the small square skylight near the back. But Kemper was still sweating some. His long, sallow face gleamed with perspiration, and his black hair, always in need of a cut, was slick and sticking to his skin. Even his goatee beard, thin mustache, and long sideburns were damp. Fact is, anywhere Kemper had hair, he was retaining salt water, which was not good. Kemper flicked his dark eyes up to the rear view to see what was going on up back. The inside of the van looked real cool. He'd put thin drapes on all the windows. The seats had fabric covers, and he'd hung some pretty neat stuff up on the walls. Sit in the not-too-cramped space in the middle of the van. Look up, and you got a picture of Alfred E. Newman smiling right back down at you. I'll tell you what. Kemper had put together the kind of vehicle most kids would die to cross country in. What with the turbocharger, the near-slick tires, and this sort of cross-border interior design. Sure, okay, Aaron had helped a little, so what? In the mirror, Kemper could see Andy and Pepper turning up the heat, with Morgan trying hard not to look at them with a great big hunk of green eye. Either that, or he was just too busy rolling his joint. Kemper also saw something else. He smiled, then noticed Aaron was watching him. Tell me how much you love me. How much? He grinned. Now that she'd finally stopped trying to sing, Aaron spoke with a voice that was surprisingly rich, low, and mellifluous. This much. She replied, and held up the thumb and forefinger of her left hand a mere inch or so apart. That much? He smiled. This much. She confirmed. He lifted a hand off the wheel and spread his own thumb and forefinger as far apart as he could. Mm, that much. He said, and then they kissed. Up back, everybody laughed. It was a good moment. Even Morgan had to stop for a moment to enjoy the camaraderie and the obvious double meaning to what Kemper and Aaron had just been measuring out. As the laughs subsided, Pepper and Andy started to pick up where they'd left off, before the girl suddenly paused to pull her lips away. Mm, can you believe we didn't even know each other yesterday? They sat holding each other real tight. Andy's right hand fully appreciating the smoothness of Pepper's moist thigh, and then her calf right down to her cowboy boot. He'd have gone higher if her thin, knee-high, pale floral skirt hadn't bunched up and got in the way. Pepper was 18, lively and damned hot. She was the reason free love was invented. Everywhere she went, guys wanted to screw her, which was okay, but sometimes it could be a real drag. Just amazing. Agreed, Andy. Then he grabbed hold of her head and pulled her lips back into close combat. Know what's even more amazing? Interrupted Morgan, finally sealing the paper on his joint. Almost breathless from kissing, Pepper lifted her face away from Andy and looked inquisitively over at Morgan. Unlike Andy, she genuinely wanted to know what Morgan had to say. Each day, smirked Morgan, 33,000 people get a sexually transmitted disease and... He paused for effect. Two-thirds of them are just about your age. The perky smile quickly evaporated from Pepper's face and she wriggled out from Andy's arms. Maybe Morgan had a point. You can never be too careful with VD. 
And what about crabs? She'd known Andy less than 24 hours. Morgan lit up his joint with smug self-satisfaction. He'd stopped them in their overexcited, panting little tracks. Mission accomplished. Behind Pepper's back, Andy grimaced and flipped Morgan the bird. He knew exactly where his so-called friend was coming from, which didn't stop Pepper straightening up her pink, backless, camisole top. As always, Andy's eyes were drawn to the row of tassels hanging beneath the bra cups. They somehow reminded him of the stage curtain at a strip joint. Sure, Andy had been to strip joints, lots of them, and so what? It was perfectly normal for a corn-fed buck like him to enjoy the fruits of womankind. And he knew a place that was only five bucks to get in. He even took Morgan with him sometimes, though Morgan tried to pretend that he didn't like adult entertainment, which was bullshit. But that's what Andy and Morgan's friendship was all about, contrasts. Andy was well-built through years of lifting while Morgan was gangly and freckle-faced. Andy wore plain shirts and jeans. Morgan went for busy cotton flares with vertical stripes and a t-shirt bearing the tourist slogan, New York, as if Morgan was somehow hip or going places. Andy had neck-length, wheat-colored hair, framing a face full of thick, rough stubble. Morgan sported a mess of black curls with the center parting and a scrawny mustache that looked totally lame. And one last thing, Morgan wore glasses and talked bullshit. Kemper flicked his eyes up to the rear view one more time. The guys were at it again. Now they were fighting over that girl they picked up yesterday. What was her name again? Pepper was sitting upright beside Andy now. She was all straight and was combing her hands through her tasseled brown hair. Andy watched her admiringly. She said she was 18, which made it legal. He himself was 20 and Morgan only 19, which gave Andy seniority no matter what crazy shit Morgan said about the clap. And if seniority wasn't enough, Andy could always give Morgan a punch in the mouth. Or maybe he could just confiscate the idiot's joint. That usually worked. Suddenly, Andy could smell pepper, and he could feel the warmth of her skin as their bare arms touched. You're so damn beautiful. He said, full of heartfelt desire for her. Morgan had stalled Pepper's engine. Now it was time for Andy to restart it. Only, he popped the clutch too fast, and she ignored his approach. What are the odds of you guys passing through Laredo just as I started to hitch? She asked with wide-eyed amazement. Trying to hide the disappointed scowl on his face, Andy let Pepper's question pass. Instead, he called up front. Hey, Kemper, can't you do something about the aircon? Andy's voice was more than a little hacked off, as it was the heat that was bugging him. But Kemper was having none of it. If you or Pepper get too hot, he replied playfully. Just take your clothes off. Aaron nudged her boyfriend in the ribs. What was he saying? Did he want to see Pepper naked or something? You're such a perv, she said admonishingly. And then she noticed where Kemper hoped to get his satisfaction from, the rear view. So she lifted her foot from the dash and stretched out to tap the mirror, knocking it to face any direction other than the back of the van. If Pepper and Andy were stupid enough to take Kemper's advice, Aaron wasn't going to be stupid enough to let him gain from it. But just in case, she called back. Don't listen to him, Pepper. <laughs> Why? Pepper was now as cheerful and irrepressible as she had been before the thought of syphilis had raised its dripping head. I think he's funny. Aaron groaned. If there was anything a man with Kemper's ego needed, it wasn't... Yeah. <laughs> Agreed Kemper, looking Aaron in the eye. She thinks so funny. Strike. She's only known you for 19 hours. Aaron shot back before turning again to Pepper. I lived with him for three years. Trust me, he's not funny. Strike two. Morgan versus Andy. Aaron versus Kemper. And every which way, Pepper was caught up in the crossfire. Morgan sparked up another joint. The first doobie had floored him. He could barely stay on the beanbag, but the second was wiping him out completely. He stared vacantly at a colorful piñata that hung from the van roof above him. 
He appreciated its tinsel and gaudy plastic wrap as only a true stoner could. But he couldn't make out what the hell kind of thing the paper mache container was supposed to represent. Not that it mattered, appearances weren't everything, right? Up front, Aaron was still swaying to the sound of Leonard Skinner. She picked up the case of the 8-track tape that read Leonard Skinner, pronounced Leonard Skinner. It was kind of funny, skin nerd. Andy and Kemper were skin nerds, as was Morgan, but with a different kind of skin. She looked at the track list. This was the Skin Nerds debut album. It had hit the stores only recently. It had already been held a rock classic. And now Aaron and the gang were going to Dallas to see the band live in concert. How cool was that? I hope they play Freebird. She said, They better. Replied Kemper, also hoping to hear the song that would go on to define an era. These tickets cost me a fortune. Aaron looked out through the windshield at the vast, lonely landscape. It crept for miles ahead of them. Hard to believe that in time this remote backwater topography would give way to the glass towers and concrete of the city. A plastic figure stood on top of the dash. It was an ornament of a dancing hula girl who swayed this way and that, in time with the rocking of the suspension. The hula girl wore a permanent fixed smile, even though her mouth was painted and her molded body was full of metal springs. A thick cloud burst over Aaron and Kemper's heads. Kemper grinned and took in a deep breath of pot. Aaron was not so impressed. She whipped round in her seat and fixed Morgan with a steely pair of eyes. Jerk! Morgan sat waving his joint in the air, laughing. He'd only wanted to share, and Kemper seemed happy enough. The stoner laughed even more when he saw Aaron lean her head out through the passenger door window in search of some fresh air. Almost immediately, her face was thick with sweat. The draft from the speed of the van was doing nothing to cool the superheated air. The heat waves rising up from the baking highway made Aaron feel as if her head was inside a pressure cooker. Kemper looked back in the direction of the fresh joint. Hey, how about sending that my way? Morgan was perfectly happy to oblige. He slid forward off the beanbag and stumbled up behind the driver's seat, where he thrust his face into the fog of grass he'd blown there a moment earlier. The fumes were thinning, but there was still enough free-floating fun time for Morgan to inhale as he handed the joint to Kemper. Careful, this shit's potent. Her face boiling in the open air, Aaron quietly decided that dope was shit. Sure, she'd like the odd joint much as anybody, but she couldn't understand why some people made such a big deal over it. Like it was all important or something. It's just a damn joint. Light it, smoke it, and shut the fuck up. This dope culture was just a load of horse shit. Beside her, Kemper pinched the joint in his fingers and squeezed it tight between his lips. The paper squeaked as he sucked on it, and the charred end glowed with the red of sudden oxygenated flame. The fumes entered his mouth, his throat, his lungs. He then exhaled. I think I can manage, college boy. He mocked, but then he'd only had the one toke. You go to college? Pepper asked Morgan, with badly concealed surprise. Morgan pulled his eyes away from the joint and turned to face her. Berkeley. With the, all the other communists. <laughs> Laughed Kemper, taking toke number two. Pepper went wide-eyed. God, her smile was loaded with such enthusiasm. It was as if simply living was the ultimate rush for her. That's really cool. She enthused, nodding her head in emphasis. After toke number three, Kemper found himself having to stifle a cough. He prayed to God that chicken shit Berkeley boy didn't notice, but he had to agree with Morgan this was potent shit. Finally, Kemper could hold back no more. Damn! <laughs> Told ya! bragged Morgan. If Mexico made weed their national product, they'd be the <coughs> richest nation on the planet. Erin still had her head out the window. From what she'd seen during their brief cross-border trip, Mexico could do with all the money it could lay its hands on. God, it was so depressing. The poverty and the deprivation. Compare that to Texas. Kemper looked across at her. He watched the wind blowing her hair, the serious set of her face, and the way she tied her tank neatly below her tits, pushing them off. But something was wrong. Why was she making a big deal over this? 
Sure, a few days cooped up in a hot van with Morgan was enough to drive anyone nuts, but wasn't that just another reason to get stoned? A puzzled frown settled on Kemper's brow. It was still there when he tapped Aaron on the thigh and offered her the joint. Aaron? She brought her head back inside. No thanks, I'm nauseous. She said that in a weird way, almost prim like a piss school teacher or something. But Kemper knew what her problem was. Aaron was smarting because she was embarrassed. She hadn't listened to him back in Mexico, and now she didn't want to admit it. Montezuma's revenge, he declared knowingly. I warned you not to drink the water down there. Aaron was stony-faced. I didn't. You didn't drink the tequila either. <laughs> Kemper rebutted almost as an attack. Maybe I didn't go to Mexico to watch you get shit-faced for four days. She fired back, and suddenly they were serious. Aaron thought Kemper had acted like an asshole in Mexico, while Kemper thought she'd spent the whole trip stressed out and uptight. She didn't join anything like she used to. She'd been holding back all the time they were down there. That's what people do there, he countered, and asked her what she had expected. A teardrop diamond ring. Wow, where did that come from? Kemper turned to look at her and saw the most wonderful girlish grin on her face. God damn it, she'd done it again. How could a guy argue with someone like her? She always did that to him. Disarmed him in an instant, with a smile, with a joke, with her can. Here we go again. He sighed. Although Kemper appreciated the abrupt positive upswing in mood, he knew she was singing the only real song she knew. When are we getting hitched? Aaron pouted and swung her head to look forward at the road. Kemper stared at her profile and natural beauty. He would have died for her there and then. She was gorgeous. One day, you'll get your ring, Aaron, I promise. No reply. He tried offering her the roach a second time. Peace offering? She smiled, thank God, and swiveled in her seat to take in Kemper and to accept the joint. His peace offering had worked. They'd reached a truce. Aaron took the joint from his fingers, then flung it out the window. Hey, why'd you do that? shouted Kemper. Aaron shot him a mischievous look, but it froze on her face when she heard Morgan, still leaning just behind Kemper. Dude, don't trip! We got two pounds! Oh, shit! Morgan stopped himself too late. He tried to stop. He realized what he was saying, but, but, it was the dope. It made him talk. And now he'd gone and shot his mouth off and Aaron had heard everything. She could see the fucked off expression written all over Kemper's face. So Morgan had spilled the bag or something. What the hell was going on? Aaron turned the spotlight of her suspicions on Morgan. What did you say? She didn't see it, but Kemper rolled his eyes. Good going, moron. Down back, Andy gave Pepper a break and paid attention to what was going on with his friends. He could smell trouble brewing, and he wouldn't miss its sweet, hilarious taste for all the soft lips in the world. But Morgan tried to make like he didn't mean anything. Um, I can't remember. He stammered absently. Two pounds of pot, said Aaron, recalling his exact words. Does that refresh your memory? Morgan waved a hand as if it was all getting too much. Sorry, um... He mumbled. Bad brain cells. He began to stagger back in the direction of his bean bag. I'll just be back here if anyone needs me. The sheepish voice and bad memory routine only made Aaron matter. What the hell was going on here? She turned to confront Kemper, and she could see he was nervous. He was hiding something from her. Morgan's baked. He doesn't know what he's saying. He chuckled unconvincingly, but Aaron knew better. She folded her arms, then got ready to scrutinize every sweaty, little, unintentional expression on Kemper's face. Please tell me we didn't go to Mexico to buy pot. She demanded. Kemper replied, over loud, repeating her words like a Boy Scout swearing an oath. We didn't go to Mexico to buy pot. Aaron held fast and kept her eyes fixed on him, probing his defenses, looking for weakness, searching for some sign of inadvertent honesty. Kemper glanced up at the rear view again. 
What was he looking at? At Morgan? The beanbag? What? What the hell was distracting him? Kemper knew Aaron wouldn't quit, so he fell back on the defensive. He knew, she knew, he was bullshitting her. So decided to plead for mercy. Kinda. Baby, I'm not a dough smuggler. He protested, using his sincere voice. Just an extraordinary guy on an extraordinary trip with the woman I love. And he gave her his best shot at a charming smile. But he was wasting his time. Funny how he only used the word love whenever he was in real deep shit. Save it. She replied flatly. Then she turned and looked out the passenger window again, angling her body away from him. Over on the back seat, Andy laughed and shook his head. The cow's head lay at the top of a mound of mangled carcasses in the dumpster. Piled high and broken within the rigid metal walls, the corpses bled and decomposed into maggots' nest soup. Concentrated, crushed, reduced to morbid waste, butchered into inarticulate refuse, food and death. The head was broiling in the summer heat. It stank. It was crawling with flies. The bovine skull had been blasted and boiled. Its fat and scrapes of meat greedily clawed away for the sake of a few cents. Only one eye remained, sitting black as death in a slaughter-stained socket, and the blood on the cow was red. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 1 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. <clears throat> i got to hand it to the uh, guest patron voices tonight. They did an amazing job, all of you, great job. Um, this is actually the first time a couple of them uh, have done the voices in a book here on the channel, uh, Stephen Palamo and uh, Cat Loveless, to name a couple. But everybody did a great job. Uh, I've put the credit list in the description below who voiced who. Uh, you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting this book complete uh, with, with you guys voicing these characters. It's going to be a lot of fun. And there's more voices uh, coming up later in the book uh, with characters that haven't been introduced yet. But I did, I did enjoy this chapter, uh, getting to know the characters a little more than we did in the movie, uh, getting in their heads a little bit, uh, getting a little more of a feel about who Pepper was, you know, and uh, the little back and forth between Aaron and Kemper was a lot of fun, especially with the guest voices. Um, still feel bad for Morgan, though, man. Caught in the middle of two couples like that being the fifth wheel. Bummer, man. Just a bummer. Um, great stuff is coming, guys. This book is uh, supposed to be really good. I've heard nothing but good, good things about it and only read good reviews about uh, how Stephen Hand handled the novelization. Uh, I think the this is one of the best slasher horror remakes ever. Uh, I think it's a much better remake than the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street or the Friday the 13th remakes were. So yeah, I'm really excited about it, and I hope you are too. I wish I was able to put out uh, a chapter or two every day like I used to, uh, but as I've mentioned, uh, an ongoing health issue... I'm going to be able to put out two, maybe three narrations per week, uh, per seven-day period. Uh, this is the second one I've done this week. Uh, I'll try to get a third one out by the end of the weekend, uh, but I'll probably have the next chapter out early next week. Uh, please bear with me. Uh, you know, I'm going to have to put a few more days in between narrations, but I, I will promise to have at least two to three chapters every week uh, of narrations for the uh, foreseeable future. I'll still be doing the Out of Print Slashers podcast every two weeks, 
and uh, slash tracks every two weeks. Uh, so content's still going to be coming. Also, uh, with so many guest voices in a book this long, this is a 400-page book, um, most of the books that I've done so far with guest Patreon voices have only been like 180, 200 pages long. And uh, there's a lot of dialogue in this one, and I have a lot of people voicing characters. And that makes even narrating and editing one chapter a huge job. I just wrapped up editing chapter one. Uh, narrating it didn't take long. The editing, uh, putting in the lines here and there, uh, took a few hours. Between that and my health issues is why I'm only going to be able to put out two uh, maybe three narrations a week, but I will guarantee at least two per week. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this chapter like I did. Uh, let me know what you guys thought of uh, the prologue and chapter one uh, of this book, and I'll see you very soon with uh, chapter two. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon. And now a message from Leatherface.